Hello everyone, good afternoon, salam alaikum, salam sejahtera to all the participants, uh, to the, all the audience and uh, participants of this webinar. Uh, I'm Halim, or Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Halim Mokhtar, the uh, current president of the Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine. Uh, MASM, together with DJO, are proud to present you, to bring to you this webinar shoulder uh, webinar series and uh, this is of course the second one that we are doing of a series of three uh, we did the last one in uh, 22nd of may which was a very successful event we would like to thank you all the participants for making it successful and of course all the speakers uh, at the same time now we are going to have today our second one which is titled as the um, uh, the shoulder when it is actually too loose or a loose shoulder which of course uh, my dear friends uh, would reflect to the instability of the shoulder and a little bit uh, a little bit of some background of that it should, it's about you know an, an unstable shoulder which can be structural and uh, functional as well so we have uh, great speakers today uh, that would actually talk about uh, this topic and i'm sure everyone will enjoy this and don't forget everyone, this, the third series of this, uh, the third uh, webinar of this series, which is going to be held in uh, 26th of June. And of course, we would like to have you all again in this exciting uh, webinar. So without further ado, um, I would like now to pass the moderator of the event, Dr. Austin Chung. Uh, to all the participants, enjoy the webinar from Legion Association of Sports Medicine and DGO. Hi, thank you so much, Professor Halim, for the very welcome, very delightful openings remarks. And uh, very good afternoons to all the audience and also distinguished guests. Welcome again to the Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine Shoulder Series Webinar 2. So uh, the webinar is actually co-organized by Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine uh, with Welcome Malaysia and DJO Asia, Asia Pacific. Um, I'm actually the moderator for today's webinar. I'm Elston Chong. I'm actually the Vice President, Vice President of uh, MASM. This shoulder series webinar tool will focus on uh, shoulder being too loose or instability. Before I actually uh, introduce our distinguished guest speaker for today, there are some simple housekeeping message that I would like to share. Uh, first and foremost, during the webinar, please type your question in the chat room uh, at your right hand panels. Uh, we will try our best to answer all the questions. And uh, please follow us until the end of the webinar and fill up the feedback form so that we can send you the certificate of particip participations uh, for today's webinar. For those that uh, haven't received the certificate for the first webinar, kindly contact our Malaysian Local Support, which is uh, Miss Jenny. You can find the phone number over the a sticky message at the chat room and um, the survey feedback form will also uh, can, the link to the survey feedback form can also be found on the sticky message in the chat room we also share you the redirect link at the end of the webinar we would also appreciate if you can indicate whether you are interested to join the hands-on practical workshop later uh, after the MCO uh, in the feedback form, the cell representative uh, of respective country will contact you. For Malaysian medical practitioner only, you can actually claim your MMA CPD points at the end of the webinar by scanning the QR codes that will display at the end of the webinar. Okay, without further ado, let me introduce uh, our two distinguished guest speaker for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Chan King Yuan. Dr. Chan is, uh, was the past president of uh, Malaysian Association of Sport Medicines for two terms. He is now currently the vice president of MASM and the vice president of Asian Federation of Sport Medicines. He also one of the medical committee, uh, medical committee member of the Olympic Council of Malaysia. He is currently uh, a consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon practicing in Glen Eagle Hospital and also Subang Jaya Medical Center, Subang Jaya Selangor, Malaysia. He specialized in orthopedic sport medicine, shoulder and elbow, knee, foot and ankle surgery. His particular interest is in arthroscopic surgery in the management of sport injury 
in, involving the knee, shoulder, foot and ankle, and also shoulder and elbow replacement and uh, unicondylar knee replacement. He will be delivering the lecture title Overview of Shoulder Instability. And then our second speaker is uh, Mr. Cliff Eaton. Cliff is, has spent most of uh, his career working as a uh, professional sport official at elite level. He has numerous publications in internationally re recognized peer review journal of sports specific rehabilitations. Cliff believes in three calls skill advocate by the Chartered uh, Society of Physiotherapy, which is the manual therapy, exercise therapy, and e electrotherapeutic modality. So by combining these three modality, uh, he believed this can actually provide the best care sport injury management for all his patients. His topic for today is functional shoulder instability, the brain and preperceptions. So uh, without further ado, let us introduce our first speaker, Dr. Chan, to deliver his talk. Welcome, Dr. Chan. Okay. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us this afternoon on a Saturday afternoon, which I'm sure you guys are very much uh, already uh, well prepared for the weekend to wind down. But hopefully I can hold your interest for a little while longer to deliver this uh, short topic on shoulder instability. Uh, my name is Dr. Chan Kin Yun, as uh, Austin said, I practice at uh, Glen Eagles and also uh, Subang Jaya, but now I also have started my practice at Orthopedic Specialist Center which is this uh, new center that is based in USJ Subang Jaya and it's just in Taman Mall to those in Malaysia and that is just next door to uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the hotel, uh, Summit Hotel in Subang Jaya. So uh, without further ado, let me just move on to a few questions and uh, so that I can familiarize myself with you guys. Perhaps you guys can start uh, using the, um, the, the poll uh, by answering the first question here, are you one of the following professionals? A sports physician, physio, sports scientist, allied health professional, postgraduate student, undergraduate student, or others? So be grateful if you could uh, do your polls now, and you've got 30 seconds, uh, and, and uh, pick a choice, and then that gives me some idea uh, who our, who our uh, the, uh, delegates and participants in this uh, conference is about. You can uh, make your uh, your choice on the side on the right hand side of your screen. Hello, this is Anita. If for those using cell phone, you may go down to your chat room to see the poll questions. Last five seconds. Hold end. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's another question now. Have you ever seen a dislocated shoulder? Please choose one, yes or no. It looks like from the uh, first results of the poll, that majority of you guys are, 50% 50, uh, 50 of you guys are physiotherapists, 11% allied healthcare professionals, uh, and uh, the, the others are um, uh, sports physicians and, and post-grad students of a smaller number. So, Are we, okay, let's move on to the next. Have you ever treated a dislocated shoulder? Please answer yes or no. Andrew, I'll start. 
we can hear you, uh, uh, Anita. Yes, sorry. The uh, third poll question released. Okay, the first poll, have you ever seen a dislocated shoulder? Well, 75% of you guys have. So that's a big proportion. And hopefully uh, with, with this sort of lectures, you have some idea um, uh, the pathology and how to manage some of these uh, dislocations. Be interested in the next the last question that I just asked, have you ever treated the dislocated shoulder? Then that would be quite interesting to see how many of you guys have actually uh, managed some of these issues before. Okay, the third poll ends. Okay, all right. Okay, let's just start off with anatomy. Um, so it looks like 63 of you have uh, treated a dislocated uh, shoulder. So that's very good. And nevertheless, it's a good uh, thing to, to remind ourselves some of the things that we will see. So in anatomy, when we talk about shoulder, we are actually talking about the glenohumeral joint. But it's very important to realize that the, there's more than the glenohumeral joint in the shoulder. There's also the acromioclavicular joint between the clavicle and acromion, and also scapular thoracic joint, which is not really a true joint, but nevertheless, it is a joint that is uh, uh, where the scapula floats on the ribs itself. So this is often very well poorly recognized in that sense that these contribute to the stability of the shoulders. And of course, uh, the, the, the other things that is involved are the muscles and tendons, which we'll touch on about in the next few slides. So let's just start off by the static uh, stabilizers of the shoulders. The bony anatomy is obviously very important. And the next most important thing is the capsule, which is a bag that covers the whole joint, and the labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous tissue that is surrounding the whole uh, socket itself, called the labrum, uh, the glenoid. And this deepens the socket. And also, uh, there's also negative pressure within the joint itself like the suction pressure that provides stability to the uh, shoulder joint. There's, uh, in, in addition to the static ones, there's also the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder. That involves a rotator cuff, the long head of the biceps tendons, and these are important uh, constraints on the shoulder. Now, it's, it's very important to realize the labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous ring that supports the, uh, the, 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 the glenoid all the way around, increases the depth of the labrum. And that in itself provides stability because the glenoid itself is very shallow. Uh, and also don't forget that the shoulder girdle stabilizers are very important, the shoulder muscles, which is a often very a poorly recognized or neglected part of rehabilitation, which is very important. And these are some of the muscles as you can see around the shoulder blade itself, the trapezius, the deltoid, the rhomboids, the beta scapulae. Uh, and, and the latissimus dorsi, all these are very, very important, okay? And on the front of the shoulders, uh, the, the pectoralis major, the deltoids, and all the other muscles, serratus anterior included, all right? Now, the rotator cuff is also very important because it actually provides uh, a contraction and a pulling strength to pull this, the, the humeral head into the socket, maintaining its stability and uh, moving it in, in a, a, a well-stabilized position when you when you move your hand in three-dimensional space. As I mentioned earlier, the osteology is very important, the bony stability. And as you can see in the lower bar diagram here on the left, by having a labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous ring around the glenoid, it actually deepens the socket by about 50%. And all these different angulation uh, in, improves the stability of the shoulder. And the shoulder itself being a very uh, mobile joint needs all these. And if you think of the glenoid itself like a little T for a golf ball, you can see that it is a very unstable joint inherently because of its very poor contact between the two surfaces. And much of the stability is provided by the soft tissue elements, which is very, very critical. Uh, most important ones are the uh, glenohumeral ligaments. Uh, which you, you can see that is attached to the glenoid itself. And the most important ones are those at the bottom end, on the bottom half, bottom half of the glenoid itself. And that's a continuation between the uh, glenohumeral ligaments uh, inserting into the glenoid itself uh, over the labrum, and it forms a, com uh, a continuous sheet. 
often it's not so easy to differentiate between the, uh, the di different tissues between the glenohumeral ligaments and also the capsule itself. So they all blend into one with thickenings, uh, which forms these uh, glenohumeral ligaments. And these thickenings, uh, like check rings, help to reinforce the capsule. The capsule and the inferior aspect of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the glenohumeral joint forms a hammer, like between two trees. And you can see uh, like sitting between two trees and is supported by the two poles on either side. And this is how the shoulder stability, particularly in AB duction, abduction, and external rotation position, and also in extension. And that is very important in providing stability to the shoulder. Another thing to remember is that when there are very important structures in front of the glenohumeral joint itself, uh, quite uh, the more important ones are the blood vessels, as you can see here. Right, these, this, the middle picture shows a arteriogram of the blood vessels surrounding the shoulder joint. And close to the blood vessels are all your nerves. Okay, and quite importantly, the axillary nerve is the, one of the more important ones that you really need to check if there's any injuries or dislocation of the shoulders. Because you can imagine if this head comes out of the joint, this nerve is uh, potentially can be stretched. And in addition, the blood vessels itself could be damaged. And dislocation can occur in any direction. And you imagine if that occurs into the chest, the body cavity, it can be quite fatal. Uh, thankfully, this is pretty rare. We don't see it in, in sports injuries, but more in motor vehicle accidents. And these are some of the issues that uh, one needs to be very aware of. So what causes uh, the pathology. Well, before we talk about the pathology itself, it's important to realize the concept of laxity and instability. Uh, laxity is a necessary attribute of the capsule and ligaments of the shoulder, and it allows for the normal large range of motion of this joint, without which, you know, one cannot function putting your hand accurately in three-dimensional space. Now, instability is a totally different meaning. It suggests abnormal symptomatic motion of the humeral head relative to the glenoid during active shoulder motion. So people can be lax and they have no instability. All right. And people can be stable in the sense that uh, they do not have joint laxity, but will still get pain in the shoulder. So there are many reasons for, for this, which, will, which we will touch on. It's also very useful to think of uh, uh, shoulder instability as a continuum. In other words, uh, people can be of various degrees of uh, instability in one direction or multiple directions, So and everything in between. So it's good to realize that this is uh, uh, this sort of concept is very helpful. Um, and uh, one can be uh, unidirectionally uh, unstable without hyperlaxity, or you can be uh, unidirectional with hyperlaxity, multi-directional with instability, uh, with, without hyperlaxity or with laxity, hyperlaxity. Uh, don't worry too much about the description, but just realize that there is a continuum of uh, laxity and instability in patients. Um, for those with recurrent traumatic instability, quite often this occurs from a macro trauma, a major trauma a direct hit to the shoulder or uh, when the shoulder falls, when, when the person falls onto the floor with a direct impact to the shoulder. And, and quite often the glenohumeral joint capsule will be disrupted. The ligaments may be torn and more often the labrum itself with the fibrocartilaginous ring around the glenoid will be pulled off. Uh, sometimes rotated cuff tears can occur in conjunction and also not uncommonly you see fractures of the uh, sort of impression fractures or compression fractures of the humeral head posteriorly or and or associated with a glenoid fracture as well. And those are more difficult situations to manage. Uh, once this occurs, uh, then the dislocation uh, will recur quite easily. Yeah. And often these recurrence is very, very high in people who are under 20 years old. And the vast majority of them falling between 14 to 34 years old. And it's been shown that those with a uh, uh, atraumatic uh, instability has a worse result. That means people with lax joints uh, with a single trauma dislocation are much worse off 
even with surgery. So when you talk about recurrent atraumatic instability, there are many predisposing factors. Uh, small, functionally flat, small glenoid is one of them. Uh, thin, excessive, compliant capsule is another. And also a capacious capsule, a capsule that is so big and floppy, especially in these multidirectional instability patients, can contribute to this uh, instability. And weak rotator cuff, poor neuromuscular control, which is a very important area that is not uh, well recognized, but it is something that the physiotherapist is very important uh, to realize and to rehabilitate. And that's also excessive labral compliance, and also there may be genetic predisposition. People who can have bilateral shoulders instability, uh, uh, they're born with this uh, genetic uh, loose joints. Often, his, in, from the history point of view, uh, these people are usually under 20 years old and they accounts to, for 1.7% of the population with dislocation, all right? And uh, the um, mechanism of injury is very dependent uh, of the direction of the force that's applied to the shoulder and that will result in the, uh, the direction of instability. The direction of instability is very important to be, uh, to be diagnosed because that will give you some idea where are your structural problems likely to be. And once it dislocates, often they develop a transient dead arm and they have loss of function. And following the first episode, they may have an increased frequency of the shoulder dislocating. And once it dislocates, there's obviously uh, in an acute situation, you will see a deformity like that. Uh, like in the right shoulder, you can see that it is a squared shoulder instead of a rounded shoulder on the left, which is a normal one. Yeah. So when you see such a thing, then you almost certainly have an idea that this is already a dislocated shoulder. Uh, and the direction of this stability also needs to be checked on stressing. And this is after once the head is put back and you need to be able to assess whether the head is more unstable in the front or at the back. And also we need to assess the patient for generalized joint laxity and also check for neurovascular status, especially the axillary nerve uh, which may be injured and they may develop neuropraxia, numbness around the deltoid region, the, uh, the regimental badge area. And these are things that one should document in, in the examination as these are quite important things that needs to be aware of, all right? And there are special tests that you can assess uh, using these special tests to determine whether the shoulder is stable or unstable and whether it's at the front or the back that's uh, unstable. Uh, Instability can be graded uh, in orthopedics is uh, zero when it's normal, no translation, that is mild, moderate or severe. And it depends on how much they translate. They can translate up to the rim and it reduces, okay, uh, but not over the rim. And if it completely dislocates, then that will be considered a severe and a grade three dislocation. Yeah, instability as well. So these are some of the tests that one can do uh, the crank test on the left is, is an apprehension test. Essentially, you're provoking the humeral head to dislocate in the front by applying pressure with the thumb from the back and, and putting the arm in AB duction and elbow slightly in extension and extra rotation with the hand going backwards. Uh, and that would force the humeral head out anterior inferiorly, which is the usual thing. The fulcrum test is exactly the same, but then only in the supine position. And there's also a relocation test, which is a uh, reduction test. When you put the elbow in this abduction external rotated position and with the elbow in extension, a slight extension, the head will translate forward or dislocates forward and the patient will be apprehensive. But if you apply a force from the front to the back, this will reduce the head back into the socket and they will feel a lot better. And the uh, other test that you can do is a load shift test. This is can be done in a sitting position or in a uh, uh, lateral decubitus position. This is done in the operating room, as you can see. This is out and then it just push back in again. You load it axially with pressure on the humeral head into the socket using the opposite thumb and index finger to try to dislocate and reduce the head. And you can see how much and which direction to the dislocation occurs. 
there's also this big group of people with multidirectional instability, and this is mainly anterior and posterior inferior or both. Uh, this is a result of a very large, capacious uh, glenohumeral joint capsule that makes it very floppy, and these people generally have very loose joints, and they can present a sec secondary impingement syndrome in the young. Uh, and uh, they, have, they can have positive anterior and posterior apprehension tests, and they have a positive, positive sulcus sign. And if it's unrecognized, if treatment is just directly to the front, which is the commonest for dislocation, and it's not treated to reduce the uh, capacious uh, joint glenohumeral capsule, then surgery is uh, bound to uh, fail. And when we assess patients for um, hyperlaxity, generalized laxity, these are the things we look at. You look at the elbow hyperextension, uh, and a little finger hyperextension beyond 90 degrees, and your thumb onto the forearm on the volar aspect, and hyperextension of the knee, and the ability to flex the spine and touch the floor with the palms uh, flat on the floor, okay? This can be uh, scored uh, with different points, uh, and uh, this can be used as a, a way to assess how flexible these patients are, or legs rather. Uh, and then that needs to be looked at when you treat your patients. What do you mean by the sulcus sign is this sunken sort of uh, defect in the soft tissue when the arm is actually pulled down. Do you remember I mentioned about the suction effect with this pulling down, the soft tissue gets sucked into the joint and you can see the dimple from the front and from the back. The drawer test is, is like applying an AP translation force front to back holding the, the uh, uh, clavicle and the chromium steady with the opposite hand, and then you push, you see how much the head floats out through the front or the back, okay? This is what it looks like in an AP and a very lax person. You can see how much translation front and back that's occurring, okay? And then you can see a sulcus sign when it's pulled. You can see the dimpling from the edge of the acromion. And these people are very, very lax. And if repair is only directed to the front of the shoulder, then obviously uh, surgical failure is very likely to happen. So what happens when you see patients with dislocation, you need to investigate them as well. In, there are a few things you can do. A simple investigation at a very basic level should include an X-ray. And the X-ray is very important not to do a standard X-ray AP view when you do a standard AP view, there is very gross overlapping of the glenoid and the humeral head. You can't see the glenohumeral joint properly because the X-ray beam is, is uh, overlapping each other. What we, you should do is get a true AP view, which means that you angulate your X-ray beam from uh, front to back 30 degrees or 45 degrees towards the midline and shooting it back posteriorly and laterally. And that will run parallel to the glenohumeral joint. And you put the x-ray plate at the back and you can see a perfectly uh, uh, a joint, a perfect joint of the glenohumeral joint with the head and the glenoid uh, in congruent together if it is in place. And you can also check for the uh, Shenton's line equivalent over the lateral border of the scapula to the neck of the humeral head. And if this line is not continuous, that's very suggestive of either humeral head has dislocated or has subluxed in, an, or in a different uh, position. And this is what you should get if you do it right with a normal true AP, shoulder X-ray, a proper glenoid, a humeral head, and you can see the joint space. And if you, if you see this sort of X-rays, you can tell that this already dislocated and is engaging over there anterior inferior part of the glenoid. The other view that must be done is also the Y scapular view or the lateral scapular view. Uh, this is quite simple to do. What you do is you put a plate over the lateral, anterior lateral aspect of the uh, shoulder and you shoot your beam along the, uh, the, along the spine of the scapula parallel to it. And you should get this Y view, X, Y, Z. That's why it's called a Y scapular view. Right, it's like the Mercedes sign, yeah? So uh, this is the clavicle, this is the acromion, this is the spine of the scapula, 
And then this is the coracoid on the front, and this is the body of the scapula overlapped by the humeral head and the shaft of the humerus. I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly. This in this picture shows an anterior inferior dislocation here, where the glenoid is, you know, that Y sign is up there. And on the lower right picture, you can see that this is now well reduced where the humeral head is spot on in the middle of the Mercedes sign, like in this picture, all right? So with these two views, you already can be quite certain that uh, you can uh, assess the shoulder quite accurately to determine if the head is unstable or dislocated from the front or the back. Another very useful view is this uh, axillary lateral view. Uh, and, and that should include the x-rays from uh, the x-ray plate putting around the shoulder and shooting the beam from your armpit up to the head. Okay, and this will give you a, a proper view of the glenoid and the humeral head. And in this view, it's very useful to be able to see any defects on the humeral head posteriorly. And, and they will tell you uh, how big is the defect, which is also called a hill sex lesion. All right, so this is the view that we're trying to aim for. And there are other views that you can do, but those are additional views, but they are not so commonly practiced. And these are the three basic views that is most helpful in determining the, uh, the extent of the injury and the pathology of the shoulder joint itself. Uh, these are actually illustrating why the axillary view is particularly useful. And this is just a model. And this is just an AP view. This is an axillary view. You can see that the humeral head is, is, has a very large defect at the back, posterior, posteriorly, and this is the front, because this is the coracoid. That's the clavicle. And that's the acromion. And this is the glenoid, like a small little cup. And you can see this is the defect of this patient with this huge, large defect on the humeral head. And this is as a result of the humeral head falling out to the front and the front of the glenoid causing an impression fracture onto the humeral head at the back. And this is what we call a hill sex lesion. Now, don't forget if the head can dislocate posteriorly, you can also have a similar defect, but this time around the defect is on the front of the humeral head. So these x-ray views will give you a very good idea, extent of the problem. Other investigations one can choose to do includes a CT scan, which is very helpful here. But CT scans in general looks for bony injuries and it illustrates it more clearly. And you can see in this area here, the first slide shows a soft tissue bank heart lesion or labral lesion. Now in this middle picture here, it shows an anterior glenoid fracture. All right. Now this sort of situation is, is a lot more complicated to fix. Yeah, so this probably would require open surgery to try to fix it. It's almost like half the glenoid is uh, completely uh, gone. And in this upper right-hand picture, you can see a large hill sex lesion. And that's a very large defect over the glenoid, which should be a more or less like a triangular area here for the glenoid. It's a whole nearly 50% or so is lost. So CT scans is helpful, but more importantly, most times we would require an MRI because it will show soft tissues more clearly, including the bones and the extent of the other injuries, like the, uh, the slap tears and all the other things that uh, may be present with the patient presenting at the time. And of course, during arthroscopy, what would need to also uh, examine and confirm the extent of the problem, this is a arthroscopic view of the glenoid. This is the camera looking down uh, from the, the head is at the bottom of the screen. The armpit is behind this uh, humeral head here. And this is at the back. And on the left side of the screen here, this is on the front. And it shows almost, uh, uh, almost one third or more of the glenoid missing. Being this area here in the middle of the uh, glenoid be called a bare spot, you can imagine nearly 50 to 30 to 50 percent of it is missing from the front. And as a result, this sort of uh, bony defect can cause recurrent instability. So how do we treat all these? There are many ways to deal with this. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we'd like to do another poll. We would like to find out 
how confident are you guys in reducing a dislocated shoulder? Uh, can uh, Are you very confident, moderately confident, or not confident at all? Uh, please do your poll. We give you 30 seconds, and then we will then have some better idea uh, how much you guys are uh, able to uh, manage these. The poll question release. If you guys have any questions, please put it in the uh, chat box. Uh, we can then uh, talk about it at uh, uh, as we go along at the end. Oh, and okay, excellent. Uh, it shows here you guys are about uh, fifty six percent moderately confident, uh, and uh, thirty six percent not confident, and seven percent very confident. Okay, that's okay. So. For acute dislocation, uh, this sort of situation has been well recognized almost 1,200 BC before in, in, in the past, during the Egyptian times and Egyptian pharaohs have been uh, documented in these papyrus where people have dislocated shoulders and, and this has been uh, uh, people trying to set it back into place. Uh, and the important thing is that in an acute setting uh, for close manual reduction, Analgesia is very important, okay? You can give it IM or IV, but IV is better because it works more quickly. Uh, the other thing is adequate sedation in the sense that uh, the sedation, the idea of the sedation is to reduce the muscle spasms. Reducing the muscle spasms is very, very important to make it easier to reduce the humeral head without causing any damage. Once the reduction is done, you must confirm it with uh, an X-ray and you need to rule out any fractures, okay? Because uh, sometimes what happens that during the reduction itself, fractures can occur and it can complicate things as well. Once this is uh, reduced, you need to put it back into a sling and if a reduction is not successful, uh, urgent referral needs to be done. Um, it is best to reduce a dislocated shoulder as soon as possible. The reason being, the longer you wait, the more the swelling and the more the muscle spasms, the more difficult it is to reduce. And particularly for sports, uh, rugby players, big guys with big muscles, you know, uh, with a lot of muscle spasms, it is sometimes very difficult to reduce. And once it is reduced, once you pre uh, prevent any provocative activities that would cause it to dislocate again. And once the pain is settled, then physiotherapy, strengthening, coordination, and neuromuscular control activities or training must be done to prevent it from recurring. All right, so how do you reduce it? Well, you can do it this way. This is the simplest way, all right? You allow a uh, two, two persons to do this, one to hold the arm that is dislocated, and the other one to provide counter-traction with a bed sheet wrapped around the chest, the upper chest from the armpit across to the shoulder, the opposite side of the neck. And then you maintain sustained gentle traction, all right? And sometimes it's very helpful to talk to your patients at the time to distract them and you maintain your traction. And when you do that, you can actually feel the head moving gently. And as you keep talking and distracting them, then the muscles will relax a bit and relax a bit in a few seconds and you will find that it will pop back itself. If there is a very big guy, a very big muscular guy, like football players or rugby players in particular, then you may need uh, additional um, uh, 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 force to apply to the arm. And you can wind this bed sheet around your chest and uh, your waist on both sides the guy pulling the arm and the guy pulling the counter traction, you can apply these uh, bed sheets around your waist and then you lean back and again, talk to them and, and uh, distract your patient and maintain sustained traction, yeah? To, to, to relieve the muscle spasms and, and uh, with good luck and then uh, things will reduce itself. What you should avoid doing is to do the cocker maneuver, all right? The caucus maneuver is the uh, one of those techniques that have been taught 
for many, many years, but it is not a good idea to do this technique, simply put, because there is a very high risk of the humeral shaft fracturing, because this technique involves rotation of the arm, all right? Rotation of the humeral uh, shaft itself. And then in, in a very osteoporotic lady, if the head is engaged on the front of the glenoid and it cannot be disengaged, twisting the shaft of the humerus, you are very likely to cause a fracture. So with, with dislocation and a fractured shaft, the life of the surgeon is immensely difficult and, and the risk of, of complication jumps significantly. So try not to do this if ever, don't do it at all, yeah? So how do you, the, the, this is a video to show you how to do it gently. See the counter traction and the traction by the surgeon here, maintaining the arm in slight abduction, you can see it just popped back. That's all you need, okay? And this is another video again. If it doesn't disengage and reduce, what you, this is also another technique is to lift the arm forwards. You can see it pops back quite easily. All right, let's just play this again. Just gentle traction, sustained traction, talk to the patient. And talk to the patient, just pull, and then you can see it clicks, it goes back in. And in this case, same again, but maintain traction and bring your elbow, the arm up forwards to disengage the glenoid. And you can get a reduction quite nicely and safely. And you can see the patient is not too sedated. They can still talk and it's quite awake. So if, if those with recurrent dislocation, there are a few options one can think of. Uh, this is just to mention briefly so you guys have some idea what talk, surgeons are talking about when they talk about repair. The bank card repair is to repair the O-ring, the, the labrum itself. And sometimes you can, can incorporate capsulography, which means plication of the capsule, all right? Uh, and capsular advancement application, that's another one for, for very large, loose, floppy tissues, uh, capsule, then you, you can actually put anchors into this, the socket and then plicate it. The alternative is to, if there's particularly if there's any bone loss on the front of the glenoid anterior inferiorly, you may have to put bone blocks to recreate the, 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 the space, the glenoid, for the head to move, without which it will fall into that hole and then come out again. This is just a cross-sectional view. And then you then reapply the uh, stitch back the capsule to the, the bone block that has been uh, inserted. There's also, um, uh, you can do a, a bone block with tendon truss, it's called the latage. This is now the current um, uh, technique that is used for particularly recurrent dislocation with failed previous surgery. And this is a very useful technique. Most of these techniques, however, have very, major significant downside in the sense that it causes over constraint, too much stiffening of the shoulder as a result. Uh, particularly for muscular advancement, uh, this is a very, very old technique which nobody practices now anymore because it just uh, internally rotates the humeral head too much to the point that they develop osteoarthritis. Osteotomies are potential techniques that can be useful but that also has risks in the sense that uh, you're cutting a normal bone and you can potentially cause bone uh, failure to unite and then cause another issue to deal with. But these are quite powerful techniques, but uh, rarely used, but they are still useful in certain, certain situations. And when we say bank card repair, the gold standard in the past has been to approach the, uh, the, the shoulder from the front burr out the, the glenoid and the front here, make it bleed, and then put anchors or stitch holes. In this case, traditionally, where, where there's no suture anchors, we use drill holes, and you pass stitches and then tie this glenoid back to the socket like that, and, and reestablish the normal anatomy of the glenoid, and, and that would uh, provide stability to the shoulder. Nowadays, we do it through arthroscopic surgery, which is a keyhole, and in, in this case, this is the way I do it. The patient is lying on the side with the arm AB ducted with under traction being pulled to distract the shoulder a little bit. And this extra post on the front there is to apply traction laterally. So lift the head up sometimes it's needed. And these are the instruments, the keyhole the instruments, and these are the TV, the monitors, the, the fluid that's in, uh, yeah, sort of a pumped into the shoulder joint to inflate the joint and radio frequency devices to uh, stop the bleeding so that we can see clearly. 
So these are the, the techniques that we use. And through little holes, which requires portals made of plastic cannulas, uh, we can insert and move our instruments around to do the surgery. And at usually the viewing portal will be at the back, <coughs> looking it from the back to the front. And quite often we swap portals to see, to have a better appreciation of the different angles and, and access to different tissues. And these are the plastic cannulas that you can see from the front. The whole idea is still the same, to reattach the labrum to the torn glenoid. Uh, and you can see the camera from the front, instrumentation from the, sorry, camera from the back, uh, and then instrumentation from front and back, or you can put the scope from the top, instrumentation from the front and back, all right? The idea is to reattach it with all these little anchors. These anchors can be non-absorbable, can be made of titanium or, or plastic, uh, peak, they call it polyethyl ethyl ketone, or they can be bioabsorbable. Yeah, uh, for the glenoid, it is best to use bioabsorbable to prevent any uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, hardware that will protrude out through the joint and cause abrasion to the humeral head. Because these uh, dissolvable screws will take a long time to dissolve away, but nevertheless, it will disappear by about one to two years. So these are the arthroscopic images showing that uh, the, the uh, labrum itself been pulled off. This is the labrum. And these are the anchors which with the stitches coming out. And then you pass the, the stitches through these labrum and then you can that tie them back. And this would provide a bumper effect on the front to stop the humeral head from falling forwards. The alternative now is now increasingly popular is to use a bone block for a very difficult uh, or failed surgery uh, with a large defect on the front of the glenoid. So they can do this keyhole wise now. Previously it was done through big incisions. Now it can be done through keyholes. And, and these are some of the uh, pictures you can see. This is the glenoid that is uh, fractured with a big bone defect. These are wires to railroad this uh, bone piece into place. Uh, these are allografts. The, these are bone donated from uh, dead uh, uh, patients or people who are, who are uh, kind enough to donate their body parts and then we attach them and then uh, with the anchors and they will keep them in position and this is what it looks like in the end where there's a very large uh, area for the head to translate so that it will not dislocate again. So uh, the other way, as we said, is the uh, latage, which is a uh, tendon block with uh, tendon attached to a bone block to, uh, to be applied to the front of the glenoid. And this is now the, also a very popular method of uh, uh, particularly for revision surgery for dislocated shoulders. Okay. Lastly, because of this big defect, we talked about the Hillsex lesion. Sometimes the defect is so large that when the head actually rotates, it falls and engages at the front of the glenoid, even if you repair the capsule itself and the labrum itself. So to stop that from happening, you need a restraint from the back. And what happens is that they put a screw through the defect and they uh, would normally tie this tendon into that defect that will stop the head from engaging through the front. And that would itself will prevent any excessive translation and engaging of the humeral head and dislocation. It's called a tenodesis effect. Now moving on to multi-directional instability, this is a more, uh, un a not so uncommon situation we see, as we said, it can be combined with other surgeries like uh, the, the bank card uh, repair. Uh, these, this, this group of patients uh, also can be considered as, as a a different group in the sense that they usually do not have a history of a specific major trauma to dislocate. What they have is a repetitive small doses of injury that progressively stretches the tissues and eventually uh, becomes unstable. And they are often very unstable in all direction, multi-directional, and quite frequently they're bilateral. And most times, uh, if you do good rehab on them, they will get away without surgery. But in those instances where so, uh, rehabilitation fails, then we have to consider inferior capsular shift or capsular application as a very good alternative. 
All right, that's what that's why it have this mnemonic called AMBRI. A M B R I. Now, um, particularly people who do a lot of throwing sports, they need this flexibility. Um, so, if these candidates uh, have capsular shift or capsular plication, there's a real risk that they may lose their range of motion, and 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 the throwing uh, sports activity may be limited as a result. So. After surgery, they need a lot of good rehab to prevent issues. So these are some of the techniques. When you put a scope inside these patients with huge cavernous type of uh, shoulder joint, you can see the capsule itself is so big. You can see it's such so much space. Normally the humeral head is very close to the glenoid. It's so distracted. So that space needs to be reduced. <clears throat> you can reduce it arthroscopically by plicating it. That means you pull up all these tissues and then you tie them down front and back to reduce this capacious volume and that would provide stability in all directions. Traditionally, this has been done through an open procedure, which is a very uh, extensive procedure. And uh, you basically uh, go into the joint, you make a decision and then you plicate it like a breast, your, like your, your, your vest jacket, left over right, and then you stitch them all together. All right, and the idea again is to reduce this huge capacious, capacious volume of the shoulder joint capsule uh, and by plicating it up and then closing the rotator cuff interval to increase the tightness of the uh, capsule. Don't forget that we also have posterior instability, uh, which is a very important thing that is uh, not often recognized, uh, but it, is, it accounts for only one to 3.8% and most of the time it's missed. 70 to uh, 70 to 79 percent. Quite often, people presenting with shoulder pain after seizures or epilepsy. These are the things that you really need to be uh, be aware of. Posterior dislocation or instability is a real possibility. Or people with who had electric shock or electric convulsive therapy for the epilepsy. Uh, these are the people who are very prone to getting posterior instabilities. Other causes include Charcot shoulders, scapular aplasia neurovascular disease like strokes or head injuries and connective tissue disorders. I currently have a patient with the same condition. She's dislocating all her joints which is causing a lot of headaches with multiple surgeries. Um, and then also multidirectional instability as we mentioned and also be aware there are people who can actually voluntarily dislocate their shoulders posteriorly and they can do this as a party trick these sort of patients should not have any surgery because they will fail because they repetitively dislocating their shoulders uh, for party amusement would cause uh, you know damage to whatever surgical procedures that has been done. And uh, this can be tested on examination by doing a jerk test. And this is what it looks like, the jerk test. Out, in, out, in again out again, in again. So these are the tests that you can see. You can do, you can see this guy is hardly flinching. So you get a bit worried when they're not even in pain, when they can do this sort of thing. So best to avoid surgery on this sort of patients, but uh, rehabilitate them carefully. Now, x-rays is very, very important. When you see an x-ray like that, you don't see the neck of the humeral head, but just a round ball, like a, like a stick, a round ball on the stick, which is like a light bulb, this is what we call a light bulb sign. These are signs that is suggestive of a posterior dislocation. So you, the humeral head now has rotated posteriorly and then you're looking end on with the x-ray. So when you see a light bulb sign like that, you need to be aware this could be a posterior dislocation and you need to get another x-ray view to confirm that this is the, the situation. And CT scans, as we said earlier, it's helpful. And you can see a fracture in the posterior rim. And these needs to be fixed. Otherwise, they will be very, very unstable. And if there are just soft tissue and no other major injuries, the traditional way is to put them in a, a cast like that uh, for up to four to six weeks. But these days, uh, we, we tend to proceed with surgical intervention rather than uh, put them in a cast like that for too long. Because they have, in addition to that, muscle wasting and uh, inappropriate joint contractures in different positions that would even compound the problem. Next thing to, to be aware of is associated injuries. 
uh, slab tears, the superior labral anterior posterior lesion or tear is commonly associated with uh, uh, a dislocation of the shoulder. And these, uh, these conditions are very difficult to diagnose. And often there is also a mechanism of traction or compression to the shoulders and 30% of them are insidious. And they can get pain with activity, with clicking and popping, uh, with overhead activities. And they also develop impingement. Uh, lying on the shoulder will also cause pain and then also we have reduced range of motion uh, and then reduced strength and also may have a dead arm syndrome. Also quite similar to like a dislocated shoulder. Uh, signs are very poorly correlated and it overlaps with other shoulder injuries, especially instabilities and impingement and rotator cuff tears. So it's, it's not so easy to figure out what's happening with these people when they present with uh, slab lesions. Uh, some helpful signs tests that you can do uh, O'Brien's test where you put the uh, forearm and the, uh, across the shoulder and you internally rotate it and then you apply a uh, downward force and then they can complain of pain over the front of the shoulder and these are quite useful signs to test to do but they are not foolproof they are not so uh, uh, specific MRIs you can see the biceps tendon here it goes into the joint and it attaches to the superior aspect of the glenoid you can see there's a fluid uh, defect going underneath the tendon instead of a black triangular attachment. You can see keep uh, fluid going inside. That suggests that there is a instability around this region. And this has been uh, classified at various types. All essentially, this is biceps tendon. This is the glenoid looking end on. You can see the shaggy one and the type ones. The type two, this commonest one that is detached from about 10 o'clock to two o'clock position. Uh, and the type 3 is like a meniscal tear, which is detached with a flap going down. And then type 4 with a flap, but the extension up to the biceps tendon itself, like the pictures here, arthroscopic images shown here. So the, the commonest one is this, and these are uh, uh, the ones that causes quite a fair bit of pain in patients, and particularly if they have instability associated with it as well. What we do is we insert anchors and we pass stitches around these tendons to reattach these tendons back to where it's normal position to provide stability. And these are true arthros, that's a diagrammatic image. And now it's a real arthroscopic image. You can see the biceps tendon. Uh, the humeral head is on your left out of the view. And this is the glenoid. And you can see it has attachment all the way. This thing is very, very loose. And these are the cannulas and the instruments you use to probe and, and debride that area to make it bleed a bit. And then you put an anchor there these are stitches to tie this biceps tendon back to the glenoid where it's supposed to be. Uh, a quick word about impingement. I know the next uh, uh, sort of a series is about impingement. A quick word here because it has some relevance. Um, the impingement is a result of um, a chromium itself hitting the greater tuberosity as the humeral head rotate upwards, crimping the uh, uh, supraspinatus tendon and also the bursa causing pain. Now, uh, it's re real important to realize that there is a few types of impingement. When we talk about primary impingement, this is to do with the bone spur on the front of the acromion that is hitting the greater tuberosity uh, uh, as you elevate. This is often to do with older age group and more like degenerative type of a condition. But the one that we're talking about here is instability. Instability itself can cause the humeral head to translate upwards and hit the acromion and squeeze the rotator cuff, and it can get rotator cuff dysfunction as a result. These are the younger age group, and this is the one, these are the group that I'm particularly uh, need you guys to be aware of that it exists. They can present with pain, sharp in nature, and is intermittent and is positional, and the pain is free in between, they are pain free in between times and is localized over the greater tuberosity. Uh, and then overhead activities often exacerbate the pain. And then on palpation, you can find pain over the greater tuberosity. They have crepitus, painful arc, positive nears tears, Hawkins sign, and they may even have AC joint tenderness and supraspinatus weakness that is often associated with rotator cuff tear uh, of the, uh, the, the tendon. And also the shoulder joint itself may be weak and uh, there may be osteophytes if this uh, uh, chromoclavicular uh, joints uh, develop degenerative changes as a result. So a painful arc is when they elevate their arms or abduct the arm up 
and then you get a painful arc between 120 to 80, that sort of arc, and then it goes away. Hawkins sign is when you forward flex the 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 the, uh, the arm and you internally rotate and adduct it at the same time. And Nears test is just a palm facing down, moving the arm up to the maximum of forward flexion. Uh, impingement tests are very useful to do. They are uh, tests that you can use using uh, local anesthetic, usually 1% lignocaine. You inject it to the subacromial space here, this space here, underneath the acromion, and that would uh, completely obliter obliterate the pain and you repeat the procedure again, all these tests, they will have uh, no pain once the uh, local anesthetic uh, is injected. And this confirms that that's the site of impingement. All right. So it's quite useful to know this because uh, quite often you can then tell that's the source of the pain in the shoulder. The, the point of this impingement uh, point here I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, in young patients with positive impingement signs, you need to exclude glenohumeral instability as a source of shoulder pain. Young people don't get impingement, primary impingement from the bone that is hooked as impinging on the uh, tendon itself. All right, this is more to do with the instability and the head riding up in underneath the acromion and hitting its it, hitting the acromion and developing developing impingement as a result. Management non-operative management usually will work. Uh, activity modification and then you can also sometimes inject corticosteroid in addition to the uh, local anesthetic. Uh, but more importantly, physiotherapy is critical in this group of patients. You often may have to do a lot of stretching, range of motion, strengthening, coordination, and possibly ultrasound and IT if needed. Uh, and uh, in those cases where some of the athletes can be an older age group or the middle age, they can develop a, a hooked acromion uh, that could contribute to this pain in, in addition to the instability. Then you can consider open acromioplasty like that to a little incision. You cut the tip of the acromion from the front and then you chamfer the edge to flatten it out to create space so that the humeral head will not hit the uh, uh, the bone here and then squeeze the uh, supraspinatus tendon causing pain. Uh, you can do it arthroscopically like in this image here, you through a little keyhole, you can burr out the undersurface of this bone to, to make it uh, flat and then create space so that it doesn't impinge onto the rotator cuff at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, and this can be done through little keyholes and we put fluid in there to expand and remove all the debris as the surgery is done. And you can see it's uh, removing quite a fair bit. This this pro, this burr itself, it's about 5.5 millimeters. So it's almost the full thickness of this burr to create space underneath the acromion. And lastly, don't forget that there is also in, uh, internal, internal impingement of the shoulder joint. Uh, these uh, more relevant to people who do a lot of throwing activities where the rotator cuff can get impinged on the posterior superior aspect of the glenoid as they do, uh, as they wind up the shoulders in full abduction external rotation and extension and they can cause repetitive injury to this uh, rotator cuff attachment here and then eventually tears can occur all right so as you can see there's a whole uh, spectrum of, of uh, side effects of all this shoulder instability and do remember that you know you need to look out for this sort of thing. Uh, shoulder instability in summary is, is, is very common and stability is dependent on bone, joint capsule, ligament, muscles, tendon and nerves and don't forget the muscles and uh, the, the tendons and the nerves these are the group that helps uh, to provide stability to the shoulder and that's where physiotherapy is very very crit critical to rehabilitate well. Uh, be aware of any complications of anterior shoulder dislocation. As we said, the nerves and blood vessels are on the front of the shoulder joint and be aware that uh, they can be injured and needs to be uh, documented and treated as early as possible. And uh, be aware of the associated injuries that I've just mentioned. And then appropriate treatment is very important to prevent any long-term uh, stiffness and arthritic changes. And don't forget, physiotherapy rehabilitation, rehabilitation is critical for optimum outcome for even operative or non-operative treatment, okay? So my last slide is to, to find out whether, uh, is to ask you guys, after this lecture, do you feel more confident 
in reducing a dislocated shoulder? Please answer yes, no, or maybe. You got 30 seconds. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, for those guys uh, if you, uh, who want to contact me, I can, uh, I'm available at the Orthopedic Specialist Center, which is next to the Darman Mall in USJ, and that's my email. Uh, and uh, please uh, get in touch and see if I can be of any help to you guys. Okay, thank you very much. And before I go, um, uh, I think there is a five minutes uh, break before we start the next session, I believe. So uh, before that, just give you the survey. After this lecture, do you feel more confident in reducing your dislocated shoulder? 61% of you now feel more, uh, more, inclined, more, uh, sorry, uh, you feel more confident. That's very good. And 34, maybe, and 3% no. Well, thank you very much. And uh, please, uh, uh, send in your questions if you have any and we will come back in about five minutes after a five minutes break okay thank you